Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 35. I'm Fred Green. Lynn Marriott is co-founder of one of the top golf schools in the world, Vision 54, along with Pia Nielsen. This week, in an episode we call The Perfect 30-Minute Practice, we bring back an episode that had a profound effect on my approach to my time on the range and how I play a round of golf. Uh, just after their second book, The Game Before the Game, was released, Lynn and Pia made separate appearances on the podcast, but 10 years later, I find that I still quote some of their comments from this first interview on a regular basis. So listen to Lynn here, then make sure you hear my latest conversation with Lynn on Golf Smarter, episode number 717, released in November of 2019. Next week on Mulligans, we'll hear our initial interview with Pia. And on Golf Smarter, we'll hear the latest from her as well. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, offering premium used golf balls at a fraction of the cost of new ones. When you purchase from TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, you'll get balls that have been hand-inspected, sanitized, and graded for quality, so even though they're used, you can be confident that opening a sleeve of balls from TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com is going to be just as good as new balls that cost almost twice as much and sometimes more. Remember, even if you buy the best balls at the highest prices, once you hit the ball... It's a used golf ball. So take advantage of all the mistakes made by other golfers and purchase premium used golf balls from twoguyswithgolfballs.com. Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans listeners get an additional 10% off every order every time with a coupon code GOLFSMARTER. That's twoguyswithgolfballs.com and that discount offer expires April 1, 2020. Mulligans is also brought to you by Autoslash.com. Autoslash.com is the rental car booking service that will save you money that can definitely be put to better use in your pocket, not the rental companies. Once you've reserved a car, let Autoslash.com know the details and they'll apply every available coupon code, including coupons you're eligible for based on your various frequent flyer programs and memberships like AAA or Costco. Auto Slash tracks the prices 24 7 and they'll let you know when they find a better price on the car you want to rent, where and when you want to rent it. The average user saves 30% off from any other booking site, and Autoslash.com is completely free. So bookmark it now on your browser and use it for your next car rental so that you can get the best rate possible from the completely free. Autoslash.com. Welcome, Lynn. Hello, Fred. How are you? I'm perfect. How are you? I like perfect. How do you get there? <laughs> well, uh, you wake up every day with an intention and a purpose. And is that how you got to write books? Well, no, actually, I'm a golf professional and uh, been a, a, a played the game since I was 11. And uh, writing a couple of golf books was never really in the vision early on. It was more just about my own playing and then helping others learn and enjoy and perform at the game. And uh, then when I started the company with Pia Nielsen, our company Vision 54, uh, people kept saying, you guys need to put your ideas in a, in a book form. So uh, the book thing came way later. <laughs> So now the book that you just released is called The Game Before the Game, The Perfect 30-Minute Practice, which I think there's a demand for this kind of content. Well, actually, yeah, we, P and I have had um, a vision when we started the company. Uh, our, again, our company is called Vision 54. But part of that vision is, was to change the way people practice. And that included the tour players, professional players that we coached, down to amateur players, and then for, of course, new golfers learning the game, that they learn, you know, that practice didn't need to be about beating balls, that it needed to be about something that was productive that actually transferred out to the golf course. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> and that transfer is a big deal for us because a lot of people spend time, money, and energy on practicing, and they get better at practicing, but they don't necessarily get better at playing golf. 
Yeah. And, you know, I received an email recently from a listener who was asking about, look, my time, and I'm sure he speaks for many people, who says my time is limited. Golf takes a lot of time. Uh, where where are things going to be more efficient for me? Um, practicing or playing golf? Um, how, how's the best way to make that work? Well, I mean, the first thing is is that, I mean, when you look at this, what we call the game before the game, is you look at what's the, the big intention of why you practice. And for most people, we think that's to play better golf on the golf course. And, you know, fortunately, there's been some research done now on practice habits and practice habits in different sports, and then specifically golf. And when they look at golfers' practice habits, or what they do in practice, they say we have the worst habits of any sport. And what they mean by that, what the research concludes, is that what people do does not actually transfer to, again, better play on the golf course or lower scores on a golf course, and, and especially like in competition, which is what most people do. So well, that's interesting. I mean, the research backs it up is that, sure. you know, we're not doing this in a smart and productive way. So to answer your question, I guess, more specifically, is that if we're, we want to get better at golf, we need to practice golf. And that's like the big intention that we try to get through um, in the book. And then we break it down into that the reality of people's golf experiences is that there's different elements. There's the physical element, the technical element, the mental element, the emotional element, the social element, and then what we call like the spirit of the game. It's kind of the the juice that keeps everything going and when you look at all those elements then you need to practice within each of those elements to that again to that bigger intention that it transfers to the golf course oh boy you said about eight things there that (laughs) i I wanted like i just want to go stop i want to ask you about that (laughs) okay sorry about that (laughs) no 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 that's okay (laughs) um let's back up a little bit and talk about um what if we don't practice golf what is it that we're doing out on the driving range well if you look at most driving ranges and p and i've been fortunate to travel around the world and this is true whether you're in japan or taiwan or europe and you know any country in europe is that what people are doing out there is they're doing like block practice they're hitting a bunch of seven irons to the same target so what they're getting good at guilty what's that Guilty. Yeah, I mean, so you, what do you get good at? Uh, nothing. Well, no, I mean, actually, you get really good at hitting repetitive seven irons to the same target. Okay. I mean, and, and one of the one of the you know phrases, or if you want to call it sound bites, that we use to have people really understand this is, what you practice, you get good at. So what most people are doing out there, just doing a lot of repetitive block practice that doesn't really have context to the game. Because the game, every shot is a new shot. And the game, in its dimensions, it's variable. I mean, the target's always changing, you're always changing, the conditions are always changing. So if you're going to actually practice for transfer, you need to practice the game as it is. What we call simulating golf. And let's have some examples, please, of, of what specifically you're, you, you want us to do or what we're doing wrong. Yeah, I mean, I mean very specifically and, and pretty easily is that simulating golf just means that you're going to have a different club every ball to a different target, and you're going to go through your routine, and you're going to try, to try to create as much of the mental and emotional conditions that also are in golf. So I often say that... I mean, of course, there's the different club to a different target, full routine. Well, we say full pre-shot routine and full post-shot routine. And then if you're bugged, let's say, by somebody rattling their change or talking in your backswing, then invite them to your practice because <laughs> that's what's going to happen on a golf course. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Or I'll give you another example is that, um, I mean, when you really look at it, if you were just to hit, let's say, 10 balls within 20 minutes, and you take a break between those shots. And then you just calculate out of those 10 shots in in 20 minutes, how many did you actually hit with the purpose or intention that you had? And that's more like real golf, because real golf, there's breaks between shots. Have you found that when people do this block practicing, like you're explaining that... uh... 
<laughs> again, guilty. Um, it's like, okay, I'll hit my seven iron and I'll hit it four or five times and then I'll hit it and then I'll hit one and say, got it. Okay. That was the shot. And then I yeah. put away, and then I put away the seven iron. It's yeah. like, okay, I don't need to practice that anymore. I got the shot that I was looking for. Right. Well, the interesting thing with that, I mean, and you know, I, I've been guilty of this also, is that you get this false sense of confidence. You go, I've got it. Oh, I've right. got that. But what you've got is a seven iron in that context. Right. So that context isn't going to transfer as efficiently to the golf course when you only have one seven iron and it's maybe come after a driver and you've had time between shots and, and all those things. I mean, it doesn't have context. So that feeling of confidence then becomes contextually bound to a pile of balls <laughs> with repetitive swings of the same club to the same target. And, you know, the other funny thing is people will start getting a really good rhythm going with their pile of balls. So they're like, oh, yeah, I got the tempo, I got the tempo. But that tempo, again, is contextually bound to a pile of balls that you're, like, scraping over what we call scrape and hit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Scrape and hit meaning scrape the ball over in front of you, hit it, scrape the ball over in front of you, hit it? Yeah, you yeah. got it. <laughs> <laughs> so then is it uh, does it make more sense to... Uh, practice with a bucket of balls or just have a round of golf that is a practice round that you're not keep it score, that you're not competing with anybody except with yourself, of course, um, or even for, don't even compete with yourself, but working on things? Is that? Oh, I mean, you know, absolutely the best place to practice golf is where it's played. And that's, you know, of course, the golf course. Hmm. You know, we often say, like, if you go to practice swimming, where do you practice it? In the swimming pool. In a driving range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. So, yeah, of course the golf course would be, you know, the best place to practice golf in its in its context, as we just said. Um, and then, like you alluded to, is that you go out with more of it being a learning mindset than a, a proving mindset. I mean, so many times people go out to play golf and they're going to prove something instead of it going out and it literally being a practice round of golf or a learning round of golf. And then you go out with... You know, if we call it a learning round, you go out with specific focuses or intentions or purposes that you want to accomplish or learn during that round, and that's what you that's what you focus on. But you're out there actually on the golf course doing it. There's got to be a huge difference between, say, warming up for your round on the driving range versus a practice on the driving range. Yes, yes, yes. So we, you know, in, in our book, The Game Before the Game, we break down practice for people just to have a way to compartmentalize this into three areas, what we call warm-up practice, maintenance practice, and preparation or performance practice. So warm-up is just that. It's warming up. It's warming up the mind, the body, the swing. And what we like to say, that, that activity of warm-up has the intention of getting warmed up and most of all, getting confident. And most people, when they go to warm up, you know, they go, oh, wow, I'm a little stiff. You know, they might they might do a few stretches, you know, that kind of thing. But then they get the pile of balls or the bucket of balls or the pyramid of balls, and they start whacking away. And then maybe, ooh, they get a little slice or a little fade, and they, call, they start what we call search and scan. <laughs> and they're not warming up anymore. They're starting to search and scan to fix the problem. And, you know, like, oh, man, I'm going to fade it today. Oh, you know, or I'm going to hook it, or, you know, gosh, I'm topping it. I wonder why I'm doing that. And they start searching for technical or mechanical things to do, which then just leads them off the big intention of just getting warmed up and feeling confident. So what's interesting is that, you know, what we, we try to tell people with warm-up is that you want to come up with your best way of warming up. And for each person, that's going to be a little bit different. And then you need to have what we call, like, uh, emergency warm-up for those days that you get stuck in the traffic or, you know, you're late from the office or, you know, something happens and you only have just a few minutes to warm up, what are you going to do with that? But that's a big distinction. I mean, in fact, we just had a tour player here this weekend that spent two days, you know, with us and we were coaching her and, and we made a big distinction about warm-up and maintenance practice or performance or preparation practice and she had you know here she's been out on tour she's won tournaments she's never really considered it that way because even on tour you know you're going to see people that are still doing that kind of panic search and scan 
warm-up practice. Uh, I th- <laughs> Did I talk too long there? No, never, never. I'm, okay. I, yeah, the more you talk, the better we all are. Um, I want to talk about the panic warm-up for a second because I'm sure we've all experienced it. Like you said, you get stuck in traffic or you, you had to walk the dog or something and you couldn't get there on time. Um, and I just recently had one of those. Can you give us a great uh, or actually the most efficient panic warm-up drill? Yeah, I mean, for some, it it really should be that they don't hit any golf balls at all. Really? Oh, my God, no, because they're so stressed. They've already got themselves in a stress state. You know, starting to hit balls is just going to compound that stress. So it might be better they do a few stretches, do some breathing, what we call coherence breathing or heart breathing. Um, we had actually, we had Dr. Bruce Wilson on talking about heart breathing. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I know Bruce really well from heart math. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, P and I, we've been uh, helping HeartMath actually get into golf. We were the first golf professionals to ever attend their programs back in, actually 10 years ago, back in 1997. Well, so, you know, there's so many different people out there that have their own version of how to improve your yeah. golf game. You just never know which <laughs> ones are legitimate or not, especially when you're, you're approaching it like myself as just someone who likes to play golf. And so I see somebody's got a website. Okay, I'm interested. You know, someone makes a recommendation. Okay, I'll talk to them. So actually you're confirming that there's validity to that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean... The thing is, is I mean, now we're getting a bit off off frame, or <laughs> you know, that's okay. We can from come what back we were just talking about. Yeah, but I'm I would sorry. just say with the heart breathing and why it's really good, if you're in a panic, you know, warm up situation, is that you want to get yourself again confident or at least calm. And I mean, ultimately, it would be that you're confident. And the heart breathing, if you really engage it. You know, what you're doing is you're stopping the cortisol from releasing into the system and you're increasing the chances of DHEA getting secreted into the system. And you're getting yourself not just in a mindset but actually a physiological state that you're going to be better off with on the first tee in a few minutes than just trying to hit a bunch of balls. And, I mean, that, that's all been, been absolutely scientifically proven. And uh, we, we look a lot at that. In fact, I'll just say this, that in our book, again, the game before the game, one of the chapters is about how to create a good play box. And the play box is a very specific performance state. And, um, and again, like being coherent and having a coherent heart rhythm is just a, a part of that good performance state. It's not everything. You can't say like heart math and what heart math is doing is everything in golf, but it's just one area that you start to understand when we want to get in a good performance state that if we learn some tools that we've got a better chance of getting there. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back now to the panic warm-up. Thank you for that confirmation that that stuff is legit. <laughs> but on the panic warm-up, I would think, and again for myself, uh, that when I'm in that state, um, panicking meaning I just pulled up to the first tee because I just pulled up to the golf course, right. you know, and I'm running over to the tee box to get ready to go, that the hardest part is slowing down to get yeah. into a playing state. Right, exactly. So that, like, what well, we would recommend several things. Like I said, the heart breathing, maybe some stretches, um, what we call Tai Chi swings are very slow swings. Mm. And where you're very present, you know, it's going to maybe take you a couple of minutes to make one golf swing. And it's just, again, the, the main thing here, again, is to get present, to feel like, okay, now I'm here at the golf course. I'm no longer walking the dog. Or I'm no longer back in that traffic jam. I'm right here. I'm getting ready to go play. You know, and, and that's the whole thing. You want to get present. You want to get calm or at least calm down if you've been stressed up and confident. So then it might be that you go over if you're, you're close enough to the putting green or the first tee's close enough to the putting green that you go over and just hit a couple of short putts. You see the ball go in the hole. You feel the ball go in the hole. You feel a good stroke. and You know, that whole thing. You get your senses warmed up to go play and that the ball's going to go in the hole. Yeah, I can see just stepping over the hole uh, on the practice putting green. Leave yourself a 12-inch putt. Close your eyes just so you can hear the sound of it going in, right? Yeah. Exactly. But I'll just tell you, there's a funny story with this, and uh, Amy Elcott probably won't remember it. But, <laughs> she um, will if she listens to this. Yeah, she will if she do- does listen to this. But this is several years ago, actually probably 12 years ago. Uh, she was playing a tournament in Massachusetts, an LPGA event, and she was leading, 
um, after the third round. So obviously she was in the last group on Sunday, and and I was helping a friend who was also coaching her, and so I was there to just watch her warm up. And so she was warming up. She started shanking it. I mean, literally shanking it. So, and she even took out like a, a lofted fairway wood, probably like a seven wood, and it was going to the right. Ouch. So what would most amateurs do? Yeah, they'd start to panic. Absolutely. <laughs> but the coolest thing about her, I'll never forget it. She, like, did not get flustered. She just kind of looked around, you know, collected herself, you know, put the clubs back in the bag. She said, hey, Lynn, how you doing? Going to be a great day. I'm like, go get them, Amy. She walked to the first tee, you know, just teed off, drive right in the middle, won the tournament. And that, to me, is like incredible composure. I mean, it's just an example because, I mean, how many times have you gone and you've had a warm-up session and you've hit the ball great, right? And you go, oh, my God, this is going to be a super-duper day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you get out on the course, uh-uh, it didn't show up. Yeah. You know, or just the opposite. You go and warm up, and you hit the ball skanky, and you go, oh, God, this is going to be a horrible day. And you get out, and voila, your best game shows up. So we often say warm-up in no way indicates how you're going to go play. So don't get caught up in that. Oh, yeah, I've never been able to see a correlation between yeah. the two. Yeah, there, there, there just isn't one. Yeah. Yeah, it's really deciding what your intention for, for warm-up is and then doing that. As soon as you said Tai Chi warm up or uh, swing, I got up on my feet. What, yeah. t tell me, what, when, <laughs> I'm on my feet. Explain this to me. I love the idea of what that sounds like, but you got to tell me what you're talking about. Well, actually, we were introduced to uh, through Fred Shoemaker. And sure, Fred's, Fred's been Fred's on the good, show. Yeah, and Fred's a good friend of ours, and uh, and we've, I think we've taken it to a different level. We do it in lots of different ways, but um, it's simply said, it's a it's a Tai Chi paced golf swing and you don't do it with a golf ball but you just make a golf swing as slow as you possibly can go mm. we say with two rules uh one that you stay present so it's actually uh training for your mental state also because your mind will tend to wander when you're going that slow oh my gosh yes yeah and then number two the other rule is is that you breathe because people as they start going that slow with something that's usually done you know within a couple of seconds, start to hold their breath and get yep. really tight. Yep. And then as they breathe, they become more aware of where there are tension spots in the swing. Mm. So what we often oh. say, like you'll see it, as they're doing the Tai Chi movement and they're going slow, all of a sudden maybe the club will involuntarily start to jerk or go fast. And you're like, hmm, what's going on there? It could be a tension tension spot in the body, you know, maybe your hands grabbed it or your shoulder got tight or, or something. Or it could just be a conceptual blind spot that you have about the golf swing. But I, what we found is that just with the Tai Chi swing, people just get more aware, they get more present, and that's, again, what you want. That kind of, again, is more of a state of being warmed up to go play. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a phenomenal thing because I'm trying to do it here, and the first thing I noticed... I was holding my breath. Yeah. Then I started real, and then I started feeling myself to sway. And it's like, oh, so, and boy, right now, Lynn, just imagine for yourself that there's somebody on a commuter train doing this. Yay! <laughs> and they're doing, <laughs> and go as slow as you can and really try to stay present, especially with all those people around you. But, I mean, just stand there and do it. And you really do feel how thing, mistakes can get magnified. Yeah, Absolutely. That's and, phenomenal. And, you know, and I mean, the one thing that we found in, is that if people are going to make, I'm going to say now, changes to their golf swing, the first thing they need to do is be aware of it. And this just, I mean, totally heightens people's awareness. And I mean, you know, when, sometimes when people first start it, they can't even go that slow. Sure. And then, you know, what's been interesting for us, and we have all the latest, greatest, fancy video equipment and all that, and of course we can look at it and draw lines, but... When people become more aware of themselves and having to be shown through a two-dimensional video screen, I mean, the changes are, are they're more efficient. And then for us, what we see when, when, you know, as a coach and we're standing there watching people do Tai Chi swings, we see if there's some physical limitations or we see if there's like a conceptual blind spot. I mean, it's, um, this is, again, a funny story, but a couple of years ago we did some training with the Canadian PGA with one of the provinces up there, and we had 
room full of about 100 Canadian PGA pros. And then we had them all doing Tai Chi swings. It was pretty cool. In the middle of winter in Manitoba. And uh, <laughs> this one Canadian pro was so cute. He got just past impact, and, you know, the club hadn't started to turn over. The face was still going straight away. And he was kind of holding on. And he goes, you know, Lynn, I knew that I've always tended to hold on to the club and block it, but now it's painfully obvious. <laughs> and that that's the whole point is that, you know, it becomes very obvious what's going on there, either for the student themselves or player themselves or for the coach. Now, it's uh, clearly a ball is not necessary when you're doing your Tai Chi swing, oh. um, but is a club necessary? Does that really make a difference of having a club in your hand when you yeah, do this? Yeah, I mean... You know, our preference would be that you do it with a club. And then we, we sometimes have little learning clubs. It's just a regular golf club cut down, you know, to a couple it's a couple feet in length. And um, and then you can do it with that. But, I mean, preferably you'd want to do it with a full, full-size full club. And then also notice, you know, how does your Tai Chi swing change from, let's say, a wedge to a driver? Mm. Yep. And now this is interesting. We worked with a young lady over in Japan, and she plays the JLPGA, and Two years ago, she came back and she didn't like her putting stats, and she wanted to improve on them. And so her name is Yuko, and Yuko started just to do a Tai Chi putting stroke. And, I mean, you know, she's been getting coaching from us for a couple of years. And, I mean, you imagine, I mean, a Tai Chi putting stroke. The putting stroke is a motor, motor skill or a motor program isn't that difficult. But she just did it to be more aware of where she gets tense. And anyway, she, you know, after she'd been with us for a while and she did this, she went back to Japan. And, and her putting stats, she went from like 46th in putting to, um, well, like top 10. Wow. And I know it sounds, it's so blessedly simple, but it can be profound in just awareness. And then Absolutely. Again, and then efficiency of changes. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we just find it to be something that... Um, you know, players like to do a warm up, and you know we've been coaching Suzanne Pedersen since uh, November. She came to our our program, our golf program. She just came with other amateurs and so forth. And and for Suzanne, the Tai Chi swing's been incredibly resourceful and valuable. And um, she often does it. Well, she just did a couple weeks ago at the Solheim Cup. Mm-hmm. Now it's just something she does in warm up to just get present and and just feel how she wants her swing to be. It's very difficult for me to stay in the present uh, in normal life. Um, I, and I could see, like, just as I said, I was on my feet and trying it. I never even got past three, a quarter way up my swing, you know, <laughs> because I'm sitting here trying to have a conversation with you, too. So it's really a distracting thing. But uh, I really want to see if I can do it, get yeah. all the way through a full swing as slowly as I possibly can. Yeah. And and I want to say this, like you know, to the listeners out there that are not professionals or low handicappers, if they're you're talking to all of us. Okay, so if you're learning, like you're just learning the golf swing, again, this is something that just increases the awareness, and we think increases the learning curve greatly. Um, and then it would be great to have a coach or you know, golf professional or teacher um, help you become more aware of where those blind spots are or where the club needs to be. And we often say it doesn't need to be a lot of explicit, you know, angles and elbows instruction. Just just helping a player just feel where the club needs to be. Maybe then you could bring in a mirror or we use virtual reality glasses where they can actually see their swing while they're doing it in real time. Um, They're just normal, like, glasses that you use on a video iPod and you you connect them to your video camera. So you, you see your swing while you're doing it, while you're doing it in Tai Chi motion. And again, like I said, for an amateur golfer or a newer golfer, it's like, wow, it's, it's, there it is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, and we, again, we don't think that you need a lot of explicit angles and elbows instruction with that. No. no if you can, that's some way you can see it yourself because I've always had the issue with, I don't know if I'm making a mistake or not, but, but magnifying it in that way right. can really help. Yeah. Can really help. Explain to me Vision 54. Well, Vision 54 started, actually, Pia can tell you more about that um, when you talk to Pia Nielsen, but she started it back in Sweden when she was head coach of the Swedish national teams. And she used it as uh, really a paradigm breaker over there to help them change some of their beliefs about what they could achieve in golf. 
and you know Annika still has a 54 head cover on her on her golf bag. Um, so Pia had that going on in Sweden, and then when she came over here to the U.S. and we started our company, um, we really decided to call it Vision 54 because it's, I mean, in numbers, it's 18 under par. It's the belief that you can actually birdie every hole in the golf course or even lower. You could throw a few eagles in there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 54 or lower. But more importantly for us, Vision 54, is, uh, it's a metaphor for believing in your potential. And what we call bringing the possibilities to life and bringing the possibilities in your game to life. So that that's what, what it's really about. So, you know, again, if you're a new golfer or you're a professional golfer, you can have your own Vision 54. And it's deciding what, what is it for you? What do you want out of the game and, and what do you believe is possible for yourself? Are there vast differences for the amateur, uh, as when I speak, um, between uh, men's golf and women's golf as far as what skills they need to work on and what mistakes they make? <laughs> well, I, I, actually, you're talking to the person who thinks that there's been too much gender. I mean, for years, you know, you had these women's clubs and men's clubs and women's golf balls and men's golf balls. And, you know, now we all know that it has to do with swing speeds and launch angles, and it doesn't have to be, a gender doesn't need to be put on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Um, But the one area that's been interesting when you look at men's and women's golf games is, you know, the physical part. And you start to really look at how we're built differently. And we're very involved with Titleist Performance Institute, and we're on their advisory board. And when you start to really look at even some of the data that they're collecting about strength and flexibility and just how different bodies move, you're, you're seeing a big difference. So... Yeah, I mean, you know, women tend to be more flexible in the hips than men do, and that's what, you know, most of the research is showing when you're looking at their golf swings and you're doing some of the 3D analysis. Um, is that an advantage? Uh, it, it could be, but, you know, if if you have a lot of flexibility without stability, no. <laughs> ah, good point. You know, yeah, so there's, you know, there's there's some other issues with that. Um, I mean, Kai Fuser, who's Annika's trainer, has said in all the training he's done with her and other players that where he finds women a lot weaker than the men that he that he works with is in the lat area. And, you know, that's why he got Annika doing pull-ups. So, I mean, that's why you'll see a new, you know, a, a woman who hasn't done a lot of athletic things and she's new to golf, she'll tend to lift the club. And it's not because she doesn't understand that the club needs to go you know, more rounder. It's just that she isn't built strong enough to do that, and she just tends to lift the club up. Up, and there may be some other physical issues that go with that. So it's really not that the the woman doesn't understand it; it's that she physically doesn't have the structure to do it yet. But they can compete with us. Yes, they can. <laughs> and make us look bad as easily as they want to. <laughs> Uh, do, Especially do in have... the emotional part of the game. What's that? <laughs> Especially in the emotional part well, of the why game. Why do you say that? Oh, a woman can shut a man down just like that, <laughs> emotionally. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you want to give us an example of no, that? No, 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 because okay. my wife might listen to this, and okay. I'd be in really big trouble. Does, does she play golf? She's starting to. Okay. She's starting to, and uh, per Joe Parent's instructions, we don't count her score. We count her good shots. Yes, excellent. Yeah. So, and she's, you know, I keep telling her, hey, you hit it straight. It doesn't have to get in the air every time. Yeah. So, so. yeah, that's her Vision 54 right now. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. That's a good call. So, uh, again, the ga- the book is called The Game Before the Game, The Perfect 30-Minute Practice. It's uh, one of my favorite types of golf books because it's not a huge book. It's a quick read. It's got tips and drills in it at the end of every chapter. I really enjoyed it, and I especially enjoyed speaking to you about it, Lynn. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Oh, thank you, Fred. It's, it's been a pleasure, and I'll look forward to doing it with you another time. <laughs> 